Kratos' journey into the mysteries of a new Norse world in 2018's God of War takes both him and players to fantastical realms, pits us against mythical beasts, and introduces an epic cast. I thought you'd be bigger. But at the heart of it all is Kratos' relationship to his son, Atreus. Learning what kind of father he should be in contrast to the person he was, and what kind of man he wants to raise Atreus to be, echoes in every step of his journey. Do not be sorry. Be better. So it's no surprise that one of Kratos' most challenging moments comes when Atreus grows sick, and the only answer to his salvation lies in Helheim, where no known fire in the Nine Realms will burn. Kratos, of course, knows of a fire from another realm he can draw from, and in one incredible sequence, we see him dig up the ghost of Sparta as he reclaims the Blades of Chaos to save his son. It is a difficult choice to revisit the past he has clearly worked so hard to leave behind him, but at the same time, it demonstrates that Kratos will do anything to save Atreus. That harrowing moment weighs on Kratos, and the team at Sony Santa Monica lets that weight rest on the player too before he ultimately retrieves the blades and confronts everything they represent. To find out more, IGN spoke to members of the development team about how Santa Monica brought this moment to life and how it revived the blades for Kratos' newest adventure. This is Art of the Level. Before we get to what that journey is like for Kratos, it's important to set the stage for what it was like for the developers. The Blades are a surprise late into Kratos' journey. And according to art director Raf Corsetti, in the early days of the project, much of the team worked without even focusing on the Blades or thinking they may even be part of the project. That allowed the devs at large to really focus on ensuring Kratos' new weapon, the now iconic Leviathan Axe, got its due. But when work did begin on concepting the Blades, the art team wanted to ensure they were retaining what fans loved about them, but also bringing them up to snuff with the rest of the work already done. Sweet Nana's nethers, what are those? Part of that work, at its purest, meant meeting the more realistic look of this new adventure. Kratos spent all that time trying to get rid of it, so we wanted to show that in the Blades. So, but keeping it as iconic as we all know the blades, you know, to be. So initially that was an easier task, right? Like just to take what was there and really just make it a little more realistic, work with the materials. It was a transition, you know, for the franchise to be a little more realistic. So we had to play a little bit with proportions, but keeping it as close as, as the old ones. And we took a step back and broke down what was iconic about it as we were, you know, norsifying it, as we, as we would say it, um, to really, you know, find what's, what was iconic. Not wanting to mess with what wasn't broken, the art team did their best to enhance the look but retain the essence of the blades. Some of the changes they did make were aided by the work done on the Leviathan Axe, as well as knowing how gameplay elements like upgrades and runes would affect weaponry. It is very recognizable. It's probably the most recognizable piece that we have, the, the mythologies. So we needed to keep that, but then also finding thematically what would make sense. For the Blades, we started to explore a lot of the uh, Jormungandr, the world snake, to come in into the designs as we upgraded, because we knew that was an iconic, an iconic element that we could use. As you upgrade the head of the blade, you see the snake come through, forming the Omega at the end. And that was kind of, you know, the final touch where we we knew we had something and we knew it, it felt like, you know, it was a, a proper way to take it into the Norse mythology and keeping, you know, keeping it iconic. Maintaining the original appeal of the blades didn't just apply to the look of them. It also mattered to the mechanical feel of them as well. So initially we did try quite a bit to make it feel very different. And I think when we saw it internally, the reaction celebrate the familiarity. I think we were much more accepting of, you know what, let's revisit this. Very important to make sure that we got the, the timing and the feeling and the similar frames, you know, we're down to the frames, right? Because people will recognize the, like the square, square, triangle combo, the, the, the now the, using the, uh, the shoulder buttons. Uh, we want to ensure that those things felt timing wise the same. So that was that was the first thing that we set out to do. We had more confidence that when we when we realized we were going to retread familiarity with the blades, we, we didn't see that as like a failure. We were like, you know what, it's good. Let's celebrate this kind of side of Kratos in this different style of game. And it helps pacing and variety, right? Like switching between the axe and the blades. In, in 2018, there's very like, there's not a lot of mechanics in that game that really force you 
to switch weapons. One of the biggest changes the team had to account for in bringing forward the blades was one of God of War 2018's major differences, a lower behind the back camera angle. Bringing a closer, you know, third person perspective camera that's player controlled really changed everything from the ground up. And the axe is the, just like the blades was for the old camera, the axe is our take on a weapon ideal for the new camera, right? And so all the decisions really are being made from the axe. Like early on in the game, we knew that we wanted to make an axe pretty early. We knew that we wanted to introduce throwing because we want to take advantage of the, you know, the camera perspective. But we also had the blades in the background, right? And we're like, well, you know, let's, the, the axe is the main thing to design the game around, but we're gonna have to figure out how to get these blades in this game. There was a whole period where we were thinking that modernizing the blades meant um, actually not having them get thrown out with the chains, but actually having them only be in hand, like knives, essentially. Uh, we thought that would be a twist, it would kind of work with the camera. It would be much more similar to the axe in terms of, you know, the range that you would be able to attack with, a little bit closer, of course. And we had tried uh, all of this work with it, and and it just didn't get the appeal. It just didn't, didn't really land. When the team returned to the blades and their attached chains, the internal reaction made it clear this was the way to go. And the road toward making the blades feel familiar mechanically went on. Going back to the issues of the camera shift, that sense of familiarity had to also apply to the way Kratos was animated while swinging those blades around. Now the perspective was going to be from behind Kratos, you were not going to see them from every angle how you saw the blades before. So it was very important for us to ensure that from that new perspective, they felt and read the same way with the same type of silhouette and posing that uh, we established in the first a few games to make sure that on the 2018 version of the game, they, you know, that playability felt very similar, if not the same. Also, another big challenge was we couldn't have the length of the chains be the same as as the previous original uh, Greek games because if you if we were to extend the chains to the same length that we had before, they would go well beyond the range of the of the new camera perspective. So we had to reel them in a little bit. But at the same time, ensure that they were, they didn't feel a little bit too nerfed. Like they were, you know, almost like he, he wasn't releasing them as far as he used to before. The chains even need to be considered from early art concepting phases in a way players might not automatically assume. So previously we had keyframe um, all the motion of the chains and any every, every move that Kratos would use the blades um, it would just be very custom made uh, every single chain was like hand animated but this time around we wanted to introduce some of a little bit of a blend so that while a lot of them are very custom made as far as how the chains uh, move and bend we did have to employ a lot of physics and reach a nice sort of uh, middle ground between using the physics engine and blending in and out of keyframe animation we do have uh, some moments in which you actually get to see the slack of the chains coming from Kratos' wrists and and going back into the blades and that is like physics driven, you know, as the Kratos, as Kratos runs on the screen, you see them kind of, you know, moving around on their own uh, and reacting to what player's inputs are versus us trying to keyframe all that, that would just not be possible. The physicality of the chains was explored on the gameplay and engineering side. And for a time, the team tried some experimental ideas with how the blades and their chains might work. Initially, there was a lot of excitement behind the chain sim. sim simulation in general is something that always gathers a lot of excitement because it looks really cool. and. And, uh, you know, whether it works for gameplay or not, you know, that's what we have to decide. But at that time, there was definitely some ideas that we were looking at with leaving the blade out there, throwing it and leaving it out and actually walking around and having the chain, you know, like, could you clothesline an enemy? Could you, you know, just, again, ways of leaning into the physical side of the blades. While there were cool ideas in play, the team ultimately decided to focus on what the blades were known for rather than trying to reinvent the knife. There was a lot of experimentation with that kind of enemy manipulation gameplay. Honestly, there wasn't a lot of success that we found in doing that because so much of the game, as I mentioned before, is relying on camera and facing. We kind of decided that, you know, if we're going to put our effort into anything, given the, the time and resources we have, let's try to deliver the familiarity of the blades that people remember more than anything else. <laughs> But playing to that familiarity wasn't a burden. It was core to unlocking the blade's potential and retaining the balletic feel of them, even with a different camera angle amongst other changes. It's always very important for us to, in every move, make it feel like Kratos is guiding the blades and he's like 
pulling and manipulating the blades and never uh, allow the blades for them to almost spin on their own. Like he's always in control of them and he, he can at any point uh, kind of pull them back and or redirect them in any in a way that he that he wishes. There's a lot that's actually different than the old games. But I think the perception that a lot of people have is it's exactly like the old games. The old combos still work. Um, and that's intentional, right? Like we want you to, to feel what Kratos is feeling. Representing the past, but bringing it into the now, the Blades not only reflected the series' history, but showcased all the incredible work that had been done to modernize the franchise, but still honor its history. The Blades' specific place in the journey allows the story to do just the same. Kratos' journey home begins with a solemn river ride set against a red storm. And while it takes control away from the player for several minutes in a game that excels at combat and exploration, it's because you're forced to sit in that boat with Kratos as he reflects on his emotions for so long that what comes after resonates so strongly. That sequence uh, uh, underwent a lot of careful planning, but also but also a lot of iteration. You know, to, we wanted to make sure we reached a, a good balance of, of the buildup, right? We wanted to make sure that there was a, the anticipation and the buildup to the big reveal, but at the same time, uh, make sure that it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't too much. That planning went into the practical filming of the scene as well, both from those performing the camera work and from Kratos' actor, Christopher Judge. And I do remember the day that we shot that on stage um, with Chris. He did an amazing job because, you know, Corey just talked to him and, and had a conversation about what it means for Kratos uh, to, essentially dig up his past and go retrieve these blades that meet someone to him. He really, really did a, did a great job of, of communicating it through without any dialogue, really, like what Kratos was going through. And I got to give a lot of credit to Corey on this one, obviously, to have the kind of confidence to let it sit in that. we filmed the circles around it deliberately slowly to you know just just let him stew un until you know there would be a Athena moment where it pops up i think the tough thing was not rushing it from either the the, the person holding the camera and walking around him and, and not feeling the need to rush it and and just you know getting getting the buy-in from from people who want to get back on the buttons the length of that boat ride also serves a somewhat meta function for the player as well those who know Kratos' history and backstory probably have a pretty good idea of what iconic weapon will do the trick. But even if players don't know, the solemnity of this long river ride solidifies the importance of what's to come. Having that boat ride was a way to show those players who, seeing the blades, they may recognize it because they're kind of iconic to Kratos if they knew anything about Kratos or PlayStation in general. Um, they could recognize it, but Having to watch Kratos go through that boat ride and, and all that leading up to it shows that even if it doesn't have that same hook to them because they didn't play the old games with the Blades, they could see that it was really powerful to Kratos. So that was kind of our window in to also help you know, players who haven't played the original games. Everything from Kratos' contemplative state to the chaotic nature around him beautifully illustrates and underscores how important the moment that's coming is for him. That attention to detail can be seen even in small character decisions, like a choice Kratos makes at the onset of the boat ride. For that sequence on the boat, we deliberately, you know, every time Kratos gets into the boat, he pulls Mimir off his hip and sets him on, on the bench across, you know, usually sitting next to Atreus. But, you know, we del very deliberately left him on Kratos' hip. Not only because, you know, we might have issues of Athena clipping into him sitting there or whatever, but like, this isn't a moment for Mimir. This is a moment specifically for Kratos. And Mimir knows that Kratos is really going through stuff. As soon as he leaves Freya's house, he says something and Kratos says, you know, leave me be. Mimir leaves him be. But Kratos isn't alone for the entire ride. At one point, the visage of the Greek goddess Athena appears. Athena. And given Kratos' fraught but important history with her, the devs knew she had to be the figure from his past to haunt him in this moment. Get out of my head. Of all the gods, Athena was the one that Kratos trusted the most. And then he ultimately felt manipulated by her uh, by the end of God of War 3. Look around you, Athena. 
The world stands in ruin. What good is your message? So we always knew it was going to be Athena. Um, and the fact that we could get uh, Carol, who played Athena in, in God of War II, uh, to come back and, and play the role, and she was so great. And just hearing her voice brought it all, you know, to life. There's no way you can hide, Spartan. And it wasn't just the voice the developers wanted to ring forth from the past. Her look is specifically meant to be as close as possible to her previous appearance. So we wanted to be exactly what his last memory was of her. So we actually took the character from the past games and we did a little bit to, you know, improve on the details and the sculpt and all that, but the model is one-to-one -to, -one to what it used to be, really to sell that, that it is it is Athena. It is what we all remember her to look like. Pretend to be everything you are not. Teacher. Husband. Father. The specter of Athena follows Kratos back to his home, where he eventually retrieves the hidden blades of chaos from underneath the floorboards. The moment remains a weighty, solitary sequence for both Kratos and the player. But Athena looms in the background, taunting Kratos that he can never really outrun the monster he once was. But as Kratos makes clear in one of God of War's most famous lines, he's not running from who he is, but he's choosing to be the monster he is for the right reasons. You will always be a monster. I know. but I am your monster no longer. Being able to drop that line of I'm your monster no longer, that moment, that was when we really felt like we had the scene, was, was that line. Because Kratos has gone through a lot, right? And what he's showing in this moment is he's willing to go through it again, but he's going to try to do it for the right reasons. That was our moment for Kratos to both embrace what he, what his past was and what he had to do, but do it in a better way, right? Uh, he's not doing it for Athena. He's not doing it for revenge. He's doing it because he has to save his son. Having that line land for us that way and then walking through Athena to show that he's not, you know, he's not swinging the blades at this apparition thing that's in his face or anything like that. He's done with that, you know, he's just, now he's the freight train moving forward. The one thing that's very specific too that not a lot of people seem to, you know, talk about is when you walk through Athena and you see her dissipate into like the, the green particles, same thing that we saw in past games when, when she died. Like all those little connections that, you know, Corey more than everyone else, like he has a very specific taste and know the reasoning behind everything. Like it comes together, right? Like it all feels like it, it really pays homage and, and puts you into this new setting and, and it gives you all the tools for you to, you know, enjoy it and, and celebrate the past. Kratos isn't ignoring his past in this moment. He's very much, as Santa Monica masterfully communicates via the scene, accepting it in a way he clearly hadn't yet in his Norse life. And in doing so, he's choosing how he wields that past. It may still be through the blades, but they are being used now to save the life that matters to him most. And that means for Kratos, the player, and the developers, it's time to make the blades an essential part of the rest of his journey. All of the work that went into making the blades fun to wield comes to a head in these moments after Kratos steps out of his home against a pack of relatively easy enemies. All right, brother, let's see what those blades can do. <laughs> One thing we wanted to make sure that landed was when you get the blades and you walk out, it's about Kratos. It's not about the enemies at that point. A lot of times when we design encounters, we focus on what we call the combat puzzle, where enemies are essentially posing questions that the player has to answer based on their placement or the enemy composition. Uh, in your head, you, you kind of create a little strategy for yourself. How am I going to get through this? When you get the blades, that's not really the point. The point is this has to be a pacing hit with all of this buildup where it's the feeling should be the blades are back and they're awesome. Up to this point, these enemies have been a little bit tougher, even with the axe. 
but once you get the blades, you sort of uh, slice through them like butter. Uh, and that was also very carefully planned, that we make sure we put the right enemies there, for you to just immediately feel feel powerful, like, like the old Kratos is back. They're frost enemies too, and so what better way to celebrate the blades than to let the player tear through them with fire? But there's actually a secret joy that many players have experienced after this initial fight, and it's one the developers anticipated and hoped for. The real moment of joy and kind of disbelief happens at the end of that fight, where there's a little pop-up that comes and it says, you know, upgrade your blades in the skill tree, and you're like, wait, what? Because, you know, people just think that, oh, it's a set piece, it's not real. And you go and you open the menu, and then you see a skill tree. It may seem funny that a skill tree could cause so much delight, but it really does, because it makes clear the blades are going to be a permanent part of the experience. Though it's late in 2018 story, you're going to have the chance to upgrade and unlock new skills for these beloved weapons. I know from quality, and them, them special. But because of that late arrival, the developers didn't want to stop players from having fun with the blades immediately. Because we could have done something where like, oh, really at the end you unlock the, the, the blades as you know them, right? And then could have taken a more conservative approach. But again, the, the moment, the value of that moment of just the blades are back is just so powerful that we, we did decide um, for the blades to really put a lot of these big kind of fundamental blades-like moves front and center. But as players come to understand that the blades are a fundamental part of the journey, the team wanted to ensure players didn't feel like this special moment would be spoiled. He's not going to put them back under the floorboards. We're not going to give players the blades and then take them away. The blades remain throughout Kratos' journey and stand at the nexus of God of War's unique place in the overall franchise. Kratos has forged ahead to a new life, a new gameplay style, and a new world. But the past can never truly be forgotten. And Santa Monica quite explicitly doesn't want to ignore or forget the past. It interrogates it head on as both part of Kratos' story, reckoning his past with his present, and as a mechanical representation of both where the series has been and how far along it's come. Thank you so much for watching our latest Art of the Level. For more, be sure to check out our Art of the Level focused on Ghost of Tsushima's opening title card, as well as The Last of Us Part II's Rat King boss fight. And be sure to let us know what game you'd like to see us dive deep into next.